So um, welcome everybody. And we're gonna be talking about self-regulation. And what I want to talk to you about is behavior, but in the context of how we get children to regulate their own behavior. Because one of the things I've sort of discovered over the years through about 25, 30 years of working with schools is that what we often do in schools and other types of settings as well is that we get very reliant on systems to do the work for us. And let's face it, what we actually want at the end of the day for our children is for them to behave even if we're not in the room. And that's kind of where I'm at with this. On this first slide, you'll see um, my at, that's my Twitter at. Um, I'm not on Facebook or any of the other Instas and all that sort of thing. Um, and on Twitter, if you don't already follow me, all I literally do is I'm, I slag off the DFE, which is <laughs> lots of ammunition for that one. And then I moan about Ofsted, but they're not around at the moment, so I don't need to moan about them. Um, you can also see there my website address. Um, I maintain my own website. So let's just say it's um, what you might call low key and quite basic. But what I do on there is I put all the um, ideas and strategies that I pick up from teachers. So that's what I bung on that website. So there's a lot of stuff on there that you might find of use. So the things we're going to be dealing with today, and I've got some nice learning objectives here for myself, are these three things. So first of all, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the notion of sort of positive approaches to behaviour. And I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that I work on with newer teachers. So some of this stuff will be very familiar to you. If you're newer to the profession, some of it will be a little bit less familiar. I'm going to then move on to talk about self-regulation. So what is it? How can we help the children build it? And then I'm going to talk about something that's quite important when we're thinking about this subject, which is where we position ourselves in relation to intrinsic versus extrinsic motivators. And just a kind of heads up here, although I've worked over the years in a lot of settings that use a lot of extrinsic motivators, whether that's rewards or sanctions, at the moment, the setting that I help to run doesn't use any extrinsic motivators at all. And one of the things we found, it's a preschool, so it's quite a different context to, to maybe a secondary school or something like that. But one of the things we found is the parents do not notice at all that we don't give extrinsic rewards. So they don't say, where's the certificate? Where's the stickers? After a while, they literally just don't notice, which I think is, is quite an interesting thing. So um, I'm going to just start off now then by, by dealing with this question. How can we take a positive approach to dealing with children's behavior? What kind of things can we do? So the first thing I think we need to do really is to see behavior as a learning process. So we're very comfortable, aren't we, with um, seeing behavior as being about um, you know the things that children do in classrooms and when it's teaching and learning it's okay we're fine with that but when it's about behavior we sort of think well hang on a sec this is separate to teaching and learning and actually it's not separate at all behavior is part of learning and children are learning to behave just as they are learning the curriculum and I think because I currently work in early years, I mean, I've worked in all phases, but because I currently work in early years, it's so obvious because when you work with teeny tiny ones, it's really obvious that it's about learning how to behave. I think another thing we need to bear in mind is this idea that we have to give our focus and energy to those who are doing the right thing. And one of the biggest issues around behavior, and I talk a lot about this with trainees, is that our instinctive reaction to poor behavior is to focus on the behavior that's causing us difficulties. Whereas actually what we need to do is focus on the positives. So it's that kind of thing where they say, isn't it? Catch them doing the right thing. So I think that's another key to this positive approach. And then I think the third thing about positive approaches to behavior is this idea that it's about a need. Now, if you say this on Twitter and some bits of Twitter catch on to it, 
they will get very upset with you. And I think what, what some people see this as saying is that all behavior communicates a need, therefore we must respond to all behavior. But actually, I think what this is saying is that all behavior communicates something to us, some kind of need, but some needs we don't need to respond to. So for instance, if a child is communicating to me that they're a bit bored or they can't be bothered, I don't have to react to that. So I don't have to react to all the needs I see communicated unless it's going to be helpful for the child and helpful for me to react to that behavior. So just talk to me in the chat box for a moment while I admit some more people about the kind of things your children communicate through their behaviors. So maybe something you've seen in the last few weeks, but maybe also um, before we went into lockdown. So what kind of behaviors do you see and what do you see those behaviors as communicating? Just have a chat to me in the chat box now and I can read out some of the things that you say to me. What kind of things to your stress okay so Zoe's talking here about stress her children are communicating that they're stressed or bored yeah and actually sometimes we do just have to be bored anxiousness I mean clearly we're in a situation now where there is going to be anxiety there's going to be difficulties for the children maybe in returning to our settings needing to be heard is a very interesting one isn't it I think this lies beneath a lot of behavior and i think one of the things we need to do as teachers is we need to learn not to center everything around ourselves if that makes sense this idea of when we listen to children we're not just listening so that we we can speak we're listening to actually hear so fear of getting things wrong yeah grateful to see a familiar face after three months off i bet they are yeah and that's lovely to hear so I'm just going to let Claire in. Welcome, Claire. And um, just to kind of moving on from this, what we often find, and I think what you're seeing here in the chat box, is that that communicates things that are missing. And those needs, those things that are missing, are things that we can work on to build children's learning around behaviour. So what is missing? What do you tend to find for your children is missing in terms of the skills they still need to develop is it about a sense of empathy is it about a sense of they need a, a, a kind of attachment to a, an adult figure who they feel secure with is it about their physical needs so what kind of things do we feel are missing and those are the skills that we need to help the children develop and i think this is why this notion of behavior as communication is so useful because it helps us focus on the learning, the learning of different types of behavior. And what we're going to be exploring in this session is this idea of moving from co-regulation to self-regulation. So this idea that we help them to regulate and through doing it alongside them, we gradually move them across to being able to do it themselves. Okay, can I just check in the chat that everybody can hear me properly? Yeah, so I just want to check that my Wi-Fi isn't breaking up or anything. Fantastic. Okay, thank you for the reassurance. It's quite freaky being just your own host. Brilliant. So I'm going to share with you now some um, strategies that I always share with NQTs. I do a lot of work with NQTs on behaviour. And what I tend to find is there's a kind of nervousness around certainty there's a nervousness around having clear expectations and i thought it might be useful for me to go through these things with you just because i would imagine some of you are working with newer colleagues or are newer to the profession yourself and these kind of strategies together create this sense of a positive approach so it's a kind of preemptive approach it's an approach where we figure out um what to do in a positive way rather than waiting for the problem to occur and then having to get on top of it. So the first thing I want to do is I want to share this wonderful quote with you. And this is a quote from um, somebody called Paul Dix. Uh, just say yep if you've heard of Paul in um, the chat. I bet you all have. And Paul Dix is wonderful. He uh, works for uh, Pivotal, 
And basically, Paul talks about this idea of having an invisible sign over your classroom door. And that sign says, this is how we do it here. It doesn't say, this is how we do it here. It doesn't say, this is how we do it here, like please. It just says, this is how we do it here. And that's what you're trying to achieve with behavior, isn't it? And it's about this notion of communicating expectations confidently. So I think we talk a lot about the importance of expectations, but something we don't perhaps talk enough about is how we ensure that children feel confident in the expectations that we're setting. Now that's got a lot to do with whether or not they think we're going to be able to achieve those expectations, but equally it's got a lot to do with how we actually come across ourselves. So I'm going to ask you, this is going to be a moment where I go, oh, I'm going to ask you the million dollar question. A lot of you will have just met me. You won't have seen me in person before. I mean, this is kind of in person, semi, virtually. Do I come across to you as confident in the way I'm presenting to you? Okay, go for it. You hit me. You can say no if you like. Friendly, friendly as well. Yeah, don't smile until Easter. No, I'm only joking. Okay, so let's just pick that apart a bit using the chat box. What is it that I'm doing? that makes me appear confident because you're effectively my class yeah i'm effectively teaching you even if it's only virtually what is it that i'm doing okay eye contact it's a really interesting one because actually i have to look through my camera to look at you yeah bubbly voice it is a big amount to do with tone of voice and i talk a lot to teachers about this idea of tone of voice and did you know that your tone of voice actually triggers the part of the children's brain that deals with their emotional state. So if I sound warm, it makes you feel warm. If I sound curious, that makes you kind of feel a bit curious. And this is a wonderful way in which I hesitate to say manipulate, but this is a wonderful way in which we can help children read the signals we are sending them. Yeah. So it's about them feeling that they know we are able to control the situation, that we're confident, but also that we're warm because teaching is essentially an interaction. Yeah. And this is why I always wince when I when I hear people talking about delivering a lesson, because you're not delivering it. You're not putting it through a post box. You're interacting with the children. And that is how the lesson happens. Yeah. So it's all about, I mean, body language. You can't see my whole body. When I do live training, I've kind of bounce around the room like Tigger. Yeah. But what I also talk to newer teachers about often is this idea of marking your territory like a pussycat, except without the urinating. Yeah. And then you do that little joke and they all kind of smile at you and it breaks the barrier down. And I wonder if some of our children coming back from lockdown it, it's sort of, I think children, actually, I worry less about the children than the adults. But I wonder if for some children, there'll be that little bit of needing to just get through that barrier again. So it's about that confident communication. Now, this next one always makes me laugh. And when I do live training, I do this quite convoluted thing where somebody has to tell me to F off, which probably won't come across on camera. So I'm going to hold that one and I'm going to use a slightly different one. So statements, not rhetorical questions. So there's a child and they're wandering around your classroom. And if you let your instinct take hold of you, what will tend to happen is you will tend to go, why are you out of your seat? Now, it's a rhetorical question, isn't it? Because what you don't want the child to do is to turn to you and go, well, miss, I'm out of my seat because I'm a kinesthetic learner. <laughs> Which, you know, kids will find it. You know, you say to them, why aren't you working? Well, because I don't think you've planned this lesson particularly well. And, you know, what do we want them to say? Do we actually want to hear what they're thinking? So when we're not asking a question, we need to think quite carefully about our language. And instead of phrasing it rhetorically we just make a statement i need you to get straight back to your seat thanks yeah i need you to get on with your work now and maybe i can talk to mum later on about how well you did 
Now, the next thing I'd just like to briefly talk to you about is what I call flexible consistency. It's the ultimate oxymoron. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it can't possibly make any sense. But essentially, flexible consistency is the notion of a consistent set of standards, but a flexible approach to achieve them. So what I mean by that is, I have the same standard for every child. So this is the standard. This is the standard I want you to achieve, whether that's to do with work or behavior or whatever. But I'm not gonna say that I'm gonna take exactly the same route to get to that standard for every single child. Because just as with learning, I need to differentiate. And when we talk about um, differentiation in terms of behavior, what we're not saying is, I'm going to let these children get away with this, and these children I'm going to clamp down on. What we're essentially saying is that we're going to use whatever support, scaffolds, tools we need to get the children to the standard of behavior that we expect. So it's like a really useful example for this is um, uniform because everybody understands this notion, don't they? And we all probably wore uniform when we were at school. Now, I've got one kid over here. Let's call this year 10, okay? Slightly disengage some of my students. I've got one kid over here who hasn't got their tie on. But that kid I happen to know is, you know, from a very supportive background, doesn't get angsty with me, doesn't get confrontational. So I go to them, put your tie out, thanks. And they immediately go, okay. Now I've got another kid over here who, if I go to him, sort your tie out, thanks, will stand up, look at me and go, I ain't sorting my effing tie out, and he'll be out the room. So I know that for that child, I need to go about it in a slightly different way. And that's where the flexibility comes in. I have a quiet word once everybody's settled to work. I kind of do a non-verbal signal rather than verbalizing it. And that's all that flexible consistency means. Same standard for everybody, different approaches to get to it. Now this next one, narrating the why, I think this is going to be so crucial and I'm sure you, you've been thinking this when it comes to the sort of wider reopening because we are going to have a set of behavior expectations that are going to be really crucial to get in place. But I don't think what we can do is go down this kind of comply or straight into isolation approach, because I think that we have to accept that the children are coming back to us from all different sorts of positions and places. And also, you know, some of these children will have been bereaved, they will have, seen domestic violence while they were away you know we need to be very sensitive to a range of issues so narrating the why is all about when i have an expectation talking with and to the children about why i need that thing to happen and i actually think that children are much more open to and willing to go along with expectations where they see the point. And when I work with trainees, I talk a lot about this idea that um, there are some expectations in school that seem to be a bit <laughs> silly sometimes, you know, particularly to the children, but sometimes to some of the teachers. And I think this is where it's really worth constantly revisiting your rules, your expectations. So we will tweak our golden rules according to the cohorts that we have. Um, we're, are, we're open sessional, so we have very flexible attendance and, you know, we will tweak what we're asking of the children according to their needs. The next thing I talk to uh, trainees about is this idea of preempting the problem. So here's a problem for you and I'm going to get you to preempt it in the chat box. So this, this is the problem and I'll tell you my ideas um, once I've got all yours and nick them. The problem is that when they come in from break, my children are full of, they want to tell me about what's happened. They had this falling out. They had that falling out. There was this problem, that problem. And I find that the start of my lesson gets kind of eaten up by all this kind of angst. So how can I get in front of that problem and actually 
deal with it before it occurs. And I'll just give you one suggestion and then we'll see if you can come up with some more. One of the things I do is I use a minute to moan. So I say to the children, right, I can see that there's been some stuff going on at playtime. So sit down with your talk partners and you've got one minute to moan. Three, two, one, off you go. So as Jennifer's saying, she hands out a starter as they enter the room. So it's that straight on task. Get them straight on task. Another method I use for this is a, a box, a worry box. There you go. Rhiannon's already said that. Meet and greet at the door. Worry wall. Meet in the playground. And all these things, communication books you're talking about, what you're doing there is you know that a problem is likely to occur and you get in front of that problem. And that's all that that is effectively doing. Now, another nice one is this idea of moving into a line. And we might have quite a bit of this in the kind of post lockdown world where we need to move children, but in a really specific way around the setting. And something I'll often do, particularly with the younger ones, but you can kind of get away with it as an ironic touch with the older ones, is I'll give them an imaginative context with which to move to the line. So I'll say to them, there's a giant and it's asleep under the floor. We don't want to wake it up. So can we tiptoe, tiptoe, tiptoe to the line so we don't wake him up? And the children, they're so focused on this idea of there being a giant that they don't even think about messing around and you can do it with things like line up in height order line up in month of birth so it's this idea of getting in front of the problem now modeling and reinforcing expectations one of the biggest issues we have with expectations is where we set them and then we don't model them and this particularly can be the case with the idea of silent listening because it's all great and fine on Monday morning when you're full of energy and you're going to get this in place and they're all going to listen to each other and they're all going to listen to the teacher. And it gets to Friday last thing and you're like, OK, I'm just going to talk over them because I just need to get on with it. And the problem is every time we fail to model what we've asked for, we reinforce that we didn't really mean it. So just in the chat box now, pop down the one thing you find it hardest to maintain. So you set your expectations. This is definitely what you want. You tell the kids and then you really struggle to model this one thing. So if there was only one thing that you could say you struggle to model, which one thing would that be? And Elizabeth saying waiting for total silence doesn't surprise me because this is this is often the top. I really struggle to model this one. One voice rule, silent working, speaking quietly, noise levels. Yeah, I often find, which I think is hilarious, that it can be the teacher who generates the kind of overexcitement and noise from the class. Yeah, silence in the library. Yeah, you're busy chat, having a chat to the librarian. When you're meant to be being silent, miss. Has anybody ever been told off by a child? Miss, you're not doing that thing you told us we were meant to be doing. Uh, group work, that can be a tricky one as well, can't it? Although it's interesting with group work to think about how rubbish we often are as adults at group work. And I think the DfE are perhaps a good example of that. Model what you want to see, as Sharifa said. So just the last little bit of this idea of positive approaches to behavior. I've got three thoughts that might prove useful to you. So the first is distract. And you often, particularly with smaller children, but actually often with older children who are kind of in a moment of kind of almost crisis, they can't pull themselves out of the behavior themselves. So this is kind of a form of co-regulation because essentially what you're trying to do is get them out of that tantrum state by just kind of going, it's that thing where you go, oh, look at the bird over there. So uh, one good way to do this for teachers is to ask for help. Yeah, I need you to help me with this, thanks. And it is often the case, maybe 80, 90% of the time the case, that children will just go, oh, okay, you know, hand this out, thanks. Because what they're actually looking for is a kind of physical um, out from the sat at desks working. And I think often their behaviours are just signalling to us that we've kept them still on static too long. And then this second one for distract, this, is, this was so hilarious. I went to a school in Kent and they told me about this. And it's basically a code. 
And what it's code for is, I need a short break from this child who is making my classroom a little bit difficult at the moment and I need like a, a break. So what they say to the child is, can you go to Miss Jones's class and ask her if she's got the pink folder? And that, have you got the pink folder please Miss Jones, is basically code for, I need this child out of my class for a few minutes. So Miss Jones says, um, no, but I think, Mr. Frank might have it. And the child goes to Miss Frank, we've got the pink folder. And the child goes to sort of four or five teachers and then comes back to the original teacher. I've cut, nobody's got the pink folder, Miss. And it's given that child a little moment to get away from the situation they found themselves in. This second one, we get them to take a note around the classes, Penny says. Yeah, oh, Sharifa, you use that pink folder one as well. <laughs> this second one, I think, is actually really um, quite useful for secondary as well. So defer. What we tend to think with behaviour is that we need to deal with it instantly. If it's not seen to be dealt with instantly, then it sends the wrong message and so on. But over the course of probably 30 years in teaching, I've only maybe had two, I think two situations where if I hadn't dealt with them instantly, there would have been risk of serious harm to somebody. So I think we tend to, with behaviour, have a habit of sort of almost, it feels terrible because it's in our classroom and it's happening. But often, you know, you're just talking about a kid being just a bit cheeky. So deferring can be a really useful way to deal with stuff that you don't have the time to deal with at that moment. Because what you don't want to do is get sucked away from teaching and learning and having to focus on sort of firefighting behaviour. So a teacher told me about this one recently and she said it worked a treat. It was, she was do, using it with a five-year-old, if I remember rightly. And the child was doing something really quite inappropriate, like maybe screaming out like rude words or something. And she turned to the child and she looked at them and she went, obviously that is not appropriate. And then she turned her back on the child and walked away. And she said, this child came running after her going, miss, miss, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And it was that moment of saying, I am not going to give my energy to that problematic behavior. I'm just going to tell you it's inappropriate and say it's obvious and move away. So I think that is a really useful one. And just this thing, I'll talk to you in a minute about that and get everybody on task before you deal with the behaviour with the individual. And then I think diffusing is a really crucial one. And I think this ties really closely into self-regulation. So this is where you start naming what you see. And you probably do this a lot, actually, with your children. You know, it's things like saying to them, you know, I can see that you're feeling really angry about this. So you are literally naming their emotions for them to help them acknowledge the emotion and get to grips with it and have an opportunity to resolve it. And somebody said to me recently that children need at least 30 seconds to process the thing that you've said or asked them. And I think so often we expect, we go, you know, um, I need you to do this. And then we go, why aren't you doing it? Instantly. And I think often we, we would do ourselves a favor if we gave them just a little bit more time. Right, what is self-regulation and how can we help our learners to build it? Well, self-regulation has now popped up in the early learning goals. And there's a good reason for self-regulation being in there, which is that it's very indicative of positive outcomes in the longer term. So there's quite a high correlation between the ability to regulate not only your own behaviours, but your own learning, where you pay attention and so on. All those things tie quite closely into um, the outcomes that children have from their learning. But what will often happen is people think about self-regulation as simply being about compliance. So you can self-regulate if you can do what the adult says. But actually, it's about a lot more than that. So it is about the ability to be aware of your own behaviours, to understand what they are and what's happening around you and manage that. And this is where some children will kind of become unstuck, particularly if they have quite poor levels of what we call proprioception 
which is where children are aware of where their body is within space. So just try this for a moment to see what your own proprioception is like. If you can all just close your eyes and see if with your eyes shut, you can touch your index finger to your nose. So can you do that without actually having to see your finger coming towards you? And hopefully you will pretty much all go, yeah, yeah, that's, I, I should do it now really, shouldn't I? That's fairly straightforward for me to do. Children who struggle with proprioception don't have that sense of where their body is in space. So they, these are often the children who are, oh, they're so clumsy, there's bumping into things. And they sometimes call it the sixth sense. They, they refer to it as the sixth sense in the sense that, you know, it's a sense that is beyond our normal senses that we think about. And that awareness of where your body is in space factors into lots of learning aspects. So it's things like spatial awareness in mathematics. It factors into things like writing because you need to be able to understand how your body works within space to do these things. Then you've got things like impulse control and deferred gratification, and I'm gonna talk about um, that in a moment. You've got this idea of focusing attention. So how um, skilled are children at placing their attention on the thing that they need to place it on? So that's a key part of self-regulation. And we can help children a lot with that aspect by doing things like focus exercises. And there's a few of these that I do with the children, but things like, you know, having to follow somebody's hand around in space. That's a really nice one. And they, they sort of take you down and move you around and you're just literally following their hand. Um, focusing your attention. This is where this whole, you know, look at me when I'm talking to you thing is quite problematic because we can appear to be looking and listening quite easily without actually looking and listening. So don't assume, I say this a lot to NQTs, don't assume that just because they're looking at you means they're listening to you because they, their brain may well be <laughs> somewhere else. Um, Self-regulation is also about this idea of I understand my feelings and I can empathise. And empathy is a really interesting one, isn't it? And um, just talk to me in the chat box about how you help your children develop empathy. So what kind of things do you do with them to encourage them to think about how other people feel? And for me, one of the best ways that teachers do this, as Una has said there, is through stories. And not just fictional stories, I think actually, biographical stories are very useful for this you know talking about Anne Frank's story um, was a very important moment for me with my own children um, as they grew up restorative meetings sharing their news sharing other people's and also you know talking to them about you know how do you think it might feel if so putting themselves in the place of somebody else and I think drama can help a lot with that but then I would say that because it's my subject. Discuss illustrations. What do you see? What does the person appear to be thinking and feeling? Puppets, that's a lovely one, isn't it? Yeah, big questions in RE relating to their own experiences. And I think one of the actually really positives for me about lockdown with my own children has been the space to have some of these conversations. Yeah, how do you think, what, you know, we've had some real meaning of life conversations and we filed it under, PSED or PSHE if you're in um, other phases to me. Empathy can be a challenge for us, yeah, in alternative provision because it is one of these bits of self-regulation that can be problematic for children with SEMD. Yeah, definitely with that. Okay, it's also about, in an educational context, um, about sort of classroom behaviours and learning behaviours and those kind of things. So what we would hope is to have the wonderful situation that I've had at times during lockdown, which I've said to my kids, they're teenagers, it's a lot easier when they're teenagers, but I said to them, you have to work between 10 and 3. I don't mind what order you do things in, I don't mind if you spend all day on one subject, but that's the amount of time that you have to regulate your learning. And then I've handed it over to them, and that's the really scary bit as a parent. 
yeah and as a teacher but that's what we have to do if we want people to self-regulate so marshmallow experiment i'm sure you've all heard about this so i'm just going to explain it to you very briefly but this experiment is very interesting in the context of deferred gratification which is part of self-regulation it's not the whole thing so this is how it worked um about uh, six, 50 60 years ago now in stanford in america at stanford university some researchers wanted to research this idea of deferred gratification and they said to the they brought some small children into their research center and they took them into a room one at a time and the researcher put down a marshmallow in front of the child and said you can eat that marshmallow immediately but I'm going to pop away and if that marshmallow is still there when I get back I will give you a second marshmallow and if you look on YouTube you can see some videos of the children doing this and it's so funny because there are some children who literally eat it straight away there are others who kind of turn their back on it they walk into the corner of the room they don't want to look at it because if they look at it they might be tempted there's some that sit on their hands i'm sure you've seen children doing this in class where they sit on their hands to try and stop themselves and then there's one amazing kid who picks up the marshmallow licks it and puts it down and 20 minutes later the marshmallow is still there i reckon that kid would go far anyway what they found is that those children who could wait the 20 minutes settled much easier into school. And if we think about it, it's logical, isn't it? Because in order to do well at school, you have to sometimes not be the center of attention. You can't always get what you want immediately. You have to be able to be part of the community. And they settled well into school, but not only that, when they revisited those children as adults, they had done better academically. They had higher status careers. They were earning more money. All these kind of factors that, you know, aren't necessarily symptoms of a good life, but that are things that our system would have us kind of prioritize as good things. So in a way that experiment is kind of indicative of how our education system works that children do have to do these things, but also it's indicative of how self-regulation feeds into good outcomes. So in a moment, we're gonna go off into breakout rooms, but before we do, I just want to um, talk you through one more slide, okay? Zoe would eat the marshmallows, she's doomed. No, I would eat the marshmallow as well. Really interesting, if you're interested in this notion, um, they replicated this experiment recently, but in a totally different context. So they went and did it in, um, in I can't remember what country it was, but it was somewhere in Africa, and it was a different cultural context, and they found a very different type of result. The children were really good at self-regulating, and one of the reasons they were really good at it was to do with parenting so it was to do with the way that um, the elders were prioritized and the children were just expected to just do what <laughs> do what they were told so there you go um, right co-regulation to self-regulation so how do we move across to having to support the children in this to them being able to do it themselves and this is a picture of the children in our setting on their forest club day which is where our two three and four year olds spend five and a half hours outdoors whatever the weather and i can actually see from where i'm sat now i can look across to my neighbor's land where they go to do their forest club which is just wonderful i remember once i had the call from ofsted and it was forest club day and i had to literally wade through mud climb up a bank go down to where the river is to find our lead practitioner and say it's ofsted on the phone <laughs> right um a few thoughts about this and i'm going to break you up into rooms to have a chat so it's about how do we give them responsibility how do we give them independence within a system of accountability that requires us to get them through it and get them to this stage at that point and so on so how can we be brave enough to do that and it's about giving them trust even if they throw it back at us and smash it on the ground effectively you have to accept that and it, there has to be a situation where learners do most of the work 
So if you've got headphones in, I'll rip, try and ring this quietly. But this is one of the ways in which our children do most of the work in our setting. When it's time for the start of the day, this is kind of pre-coronavirus um, mode now, we ask one of the children if they would like to bring the group together. And we have a little bell. And the children get the group to come together. So that's just one of the ways in which you give trust. You hand it over, the children do the work. And, you know, maybe one of them will make a mistake. They, instead of ringing it, they'll go around and <laughs> smack somebody on the head with it. But you have to accept that possibility of failure. And we talk a lot about failure in education, don't we? We say first attempt in learning. But actually, do we really let them fail? Or do we jump in just before they get to the point where they've actually failed and had to deal with... It's hard to fail, isn't it? So they have to actually deal with it. It's about a managed level of challenge. So you have to kind of pitch it at the right level. And we all know about this kind of zone of proximal development. But I actually think you can pitch it higher than you think. Because when I look at some of the things that our two, three and four year olds can do in terms of when they're outdoors, um, when they're sort of dealing with things like fire and, you know, nails and hammers and those kind of things, I think we often pitch it a little bit lower than we could. Right, at this point, I am going to try to put you into breakout rooms. 